Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this edition of Lumina Foundation's webinar, Equity First. My name is Danette Howard, and I serve as Chief Policy Officer and Senior Vice President at Lumina Foundation. And I can hardly believe that this is our seventh episode this year. Thank you to all who are joining us today, but also who have joined us for each of the previous episodes. Before we get started, I have just a couple of housekeeping items. Today's session will be recorded and you'll receive an email once that recording is available. And for those who need closed captioning, that service is also available at the bottom of your screen. Finally, we will save a little bit of time at the end of our session so that Dr. Rabowski can respond to questions from the audience. And with that, I'd like to introduce today's guest, Dr. Freeman A. Rabowski III, President of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, or UMBC. Dr. Rabowski serves as President of UMBC, a post that he's held since 1992. And recently he announced that he'll be retiring from UMBC this year after 30 years of distinguished service as president. Dr. Rabowski is a prolific author, having published numerous articles and books, including his latest, which we'll discuss today, The Empowered University, Shared Leadership, Culture Change, and Academic Success. Dr. Rabowski has received numerous awards, many, many awards, uh, and I'd like to name just a few of those and uh, many of his uh, designations as well. They include being named one of the 100 most influential people in the world and one of America's best leaders. In 2018, Dr. Rabowski also received the American Council on Education's Lifetime Achievement Award. Something that is not in his bio is that Dr. Rabowski leads with his heart, always putting humanity first, I call him the GOAT, the greatest of all time in terms of college presidencies. And it's an honor to welcome to today's episode, Dr. Freeman Rabowski. Dr. Rabowski. I love it. Thank you. Thank so you nice so to much. see you. So great, nice to see. great to be here. And I am so proud of you and having watched your evolution over these years from junior fabulous administrator to where you are today. So congratulations to you. Well, thank you, Dr. Rabowski. So uh, some people may not know your origin story, might not know where you're from, may not know um, about your mom and dad. So can we take a few minutes to just have you tell us about the beginnings of sure. uh, Dr. Freeman Rabowski? Sure, and I, I'll say it very quickly, coming from Birmingham, Alabama, I like to say that UMBC and Baltimore are the upper South. I grew up in the deep South in Alabama, and I was very fortunate to have educated parents who had been the first in their families to go to college and had become teachers. And I had an amazing education in public schools. Uh, it was challenged without the resources, but with very strong teachers, all black teachers. Um, I had one experience of integration when I went in the summer to Massachusetts in high school. So my parents could give me that opportunity to see what it was like to be around kids of other backgrounds. The point I want to make there is that nobody would talk to me, not even the teachers. Uh, and yet you go back to Birmingham and you're in this village and they teach you that you must believe in yourself. And that was my background. I'm a very proud graduate of my beloved Hampton University and then grad school at Illinois. And I've been here at UMBC for 35 years. That's my story and I'm sticking to it, Danette. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, so when you were a, a, a young boy back in Birmingham, Alabama, yes. did you ever think, hmm, one day I'm going to be one of the most influential people in the country. One day I'm going to be one of America's finest leaders. Or did you think, I want to just do math. I want to be a mathematician. <laughs> you know, and you just made the point. I, I've always seen myself as somebody who loves math and wants to excite people about math. But you no, know, the experience I will always remember is, is having the governor of my state say to children who look like me that there was no way we were going to the University of Alabama. I remember that. I remember with tears when the black kids were trying to integrate there. And uh, I remember my parents saying, particularly my mother saying, just get the knowledge. A lot of people are fair, just get the knowledge. And so my hope was that I would just be given the chance to show what I could do. 
That was as most as I could have imagined. And my, my mother, who I said was a teacher, always thought that I would one day do the highest thing she could think of, which was to become a high school principal mm. of an all black school. That was her world, you see. So when she came to UMBC and saw this integrated setting, um, it was just another world for her and for me and for me. It really was an, an American story. Yes, indeed, indeed. And you were a child of, of the 1960s. Yes. Um, Yes. And an activist, even as a, a little boy, yep. participated in marches and protests. Yep. So when, when you think about that experience that you had uh, during your youth, and then you fast forward to the year 2020, and we were hit with a lot in 2020, yep. Yep. You know, just yep. as we were figuring out what it meant to be living, to be living in a pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> You know, yeah. um, um, many of us had never even imagined that possibility. We were then hit um, with with the George Floyd murder and, and the murder of Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery. And yeah. we know that those were not the first, but they did uh, capture the attention of the nation differently. Yes, yes. So something that that moment also required us to do was to really reckon with race in a way that we had not since the 1960s, since the civil rights movement, mm -hmm. how were you able to make sense of this time, mm -hmm. summer of 2020? Mm -hmm. What was going through your mind and what was your message to your students at that yeah. time? Yes, you know, UMBC is um, different in the sense that we were a campus founded in the 60s mm -hmm. at a time of great protests civil rights, Vietnam, uh, and we were the only campus in the state founded for both blacks and whites. At that time, when you talked about integration, it was blacks and whites. Now we have all the other groups, of course, but I tell you that because race has been a, a topic for this campus for years, mm -hmm. as we think about, and I often say UMBC is an experiment, an experiment to say, how do we bring people from all backgrounds today, people from 100 countries, but at that time, blacks and whites together and teach them how to not just coexist, but to begin to understand each other's perspectives. Mm -hmm. And as you know, Dan, and having worked here at UMBC, very proud that, that you got a foundation here. Yes, uh, the fact is that we can all be better. We can all be better. I don't care how well a campus is doing, there's always more to do. And what I would say is that the period of 2020, in many ways, reminded me of the period in the 60s. Hmm. Our Congress couldn't get anything done for a good while there. President Kennedy was not able to, to bring things about. Finally, President Johnson did after a number of protests, but it wasn't just the Children's March in which I participated, but it was the bombing of the church and those four little girls. And my friends, you know, it was all that horror as we see the violence today and the police brutality. And what that meant was for me in 2020, when my students said, well, we've never, it's never been this bad before. And I would say, no, no, you need to know your history. Yes, it has been that bad, that bad before the 60s, the 1860s, the 1960s, that it was, it was tough. Now we've got more technology, more visibility. And you see it more closely, but they were just beginning in the 60s to show when all of my little friends and we were marching in, in the fire hoses and the dogs and people began to talk about that. What gives me hope and what I said a year ago was this, that after all of that challenge period, that period of frustration and hopelessness after those children were killed, uh, that what happened? We had legislation. We had the Voting Rights Act. We had the Higher Education Act in 65, the Civil Rights Act. And all of a sudden we changed and we started having more, and then the Pell Grant Act, and we began to get more people into college and we began to make progress. Mm -hmm. Not as much as we needed, but some progress. Then we get to this period and we see ourselves going backwards in some ways. You know, when we think about low-income children of color and generally, and, and what does not happen for them. This is why Lumina is so important, it seems to me. And so this is what I would say, that we need to learn from the past what worked. And one of the things that worked, voting and legislation and developing leaders who could speak truth to power in different ways. And we need that today more than ever. But helping our students to appreciate the broad liberal arts, 
and what we get from studying our history as a country, as African Americans, as other groups, and what we get from studying philosophy and, and the ethical questions here. And then you think about the public health issues, you think about the social justice issues, you think about, uh, quite frankly, the academic and income and health disparities issues. Mm -hmm. And what I learned and what my colleagues and I have been talking about is how do we help our students put all of this in perspective in the same way that we had to do that in the 60s. Mm. Yes, that's very helpful. And you, you, you talk about UMBC um, from its inception being a yeah. different kind of institution. Yes. Um, and, and as far as higher education goes, UMBC is still a young yes. institution, yes. Uh, having been founded in, in, the, in the 60s. Yep. And, and as I was looking at the history of UMBC um, and, and the, the trajectory that you have been on, just going back to the 80s, you know, graduation rates were, were not something that no. I think you, you would have held up as being no. in, proud of, um, no. somewhere I think in the 30 percentage yep. area. Yep. Yep. Uh, when you assumed the helm, Dr. Rabowski, I think graduation rates were around 40, 45% or so. Yep. Um, today, you uh, are graduating 65% of your students, but that's not the full story because another 10% transfer and graduate, and then another 10% are still enrolled. So, yep. so you can account for 85% of your students, which and is unheard of. And there is no difference in the rate at which your students graduate by race and ethnicity. Yeah, that's exactly right. The, so the good news, though, let me just yes. the good news is that since that was written in that book, we've oh. gotten up to 70 percent. Well, that's here, six years, 70 percent plus yes. the others that we talk about. So I'm that's very awesome. pleased with that. <laughs> you have to write another book. You have to write yeah. another book that's so I can get the update. But that's, that's it. Fantastic. That's it. <laughs> um, so so there are some people who say that equity and excellence cannot coexist, oh. right? That that one comes at the expense of the other, sure. that when sure. you prioritize one, the other one suffers. Yeah. But you and your colleagues have coined this phrase of inclusive excellence. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Can you exactly tell us what right. that means and how you think about that yes. as you think about student success? You know, I my TED Talk gets people either upset or reaffirming what I'm saying in that TED talk on success in science, which I now say is true for success in academics in general. And that is the high expectations that we need to have, but not just for our students, but for ourselves as the professoriate, as administrators. It's not just about what are the students doing, what are we doing differently to ensure that more people from all backgrounds succeed, building community among those students, and then knowing that it takes scientists to produce scientists, but it takes people in the humanities to pull people into the humanities. And then we have to be able to look in the mirror and to be honest about what works well and not. And so when I think about inclusive excellence, when we talk about it, it is the idea that we truly believe we can find excellence in any group that our students coming from a variety of backgrounds can bring what they have to offer. We give them what we have and we can build excellence. We call UMBC the house of grit. It's mm -hmm. not about who's smart and who's not. No, it's about attitude and mindset. Uh, the name of our Chesapeake Bay Retriever uh, is true grit, true grit. Mm -hmm. And it's this notion. And I, 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 I love the work of um, of uh, people who talk about grit uh, there at, at Penn and at Stanford, the, the scholars, but we've been doing this 20 years. Mm -hmm. And the idea is this, that excellence, inclusive excellence means you look at, at all the different ways that we can be different. And you start from the point of view is that we can build excellence in every one of those groups mm -hmm. and that we make each other better. People are shocked to know that 60% of our undergraduates have at least one parent from another country. Wow. Very surprising to people. They come out of military families. They come from the intelligence community. They come out of diplomacy. They're people who came here to go to grad school. And then their kids are here now. And they come heavily from the Baltimore, Washington corridor, but from New York and through this period. This is, the, this is a lot of people come south to us. Now, why do I tell you that? Because we want to know that whether somebody has a parent from Jamaica or from Russia, or from South Carolina, that they can all excel mm -hmm. and we can learn from each other. So we talk about both international diversity and domestic diversity. Mm. And we think it's very important to know with specificity the backgrounds of our students so we can understand what we can do 
to be as effective in elevating a conversation to get them thinking you can be the best. That's mm -hmm. the idea. So that reminds me of something, a point that you and your co-authors made se several times in the book. And I think it was we, meaning at UMBC, we aim to be what America hopes to be or, oh, or yeah. something yeah. along those lines. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. That's exactly it. Yeah. So, so oh, is yeah. that what you meant by that phrase? It's a great yeah. question. Great question. First of all, we like saying when you walk through the campus, uh, you will get the feel of the plaza of nations at the UN. You do see people of all races, all backgrounds, all religions. We're very proud of that. But it's wonderful to say that you can take any one of those groups and look at our graduation rates and performance, and there is no statistically significant difference. That's mm -hmm. number one. That you can see people from all of humankind and see people respecting each other and see people appreciating who they are and their own culture, but also mixing it up and getting to know others from other backgrounds. And, and with one essential message, I say that the significance of UMBC is that we're saying to this country and beyond that you don't have to be rich hmm. as a university or a person and be the best. That should be the American story, that you don't have to come from great privilege to become best in class. And we take great pride in that. When I talk about, you've heard me saying it across my forehead, Dr. Kismikia Kaur, but I keep going back to that name because she's in the news now. She's on the cover of Time Magazine, yes. first black woman in the world to be a part of creating the vaccine. She led the team with Bunny Graham. I mean, nobody ever heard of the idea of a young black woman creating a vaccine, you know, or Kafri Zarasa at Duke, another one of our guys, uh, wonderful four black men on the faculty there at Duke and tenured or tenure track positions, but he's created a pacemaker for the brain to address schizophrenia. Mm. Or the president of, of Clemson, wonderful working class white kid who is now one of my mentees, president of Clemson, first in his family to go to college. That's that point. You know, it's, it's that idea. Or on my campus, Mike Summers, Harvard Hughes investigator, National Academy of, of Sciences, um, coming from a junior college at that time in Florida. Hmm. Then going to a, a small college in Florida and then Emory, and now Howard Hughes investigator, young white guy, now young at 60, but producing one of the largest numbers of blacks who go on in biochemistry. You hmm. know, so people from humble beginnings who become best in class. Hmm. That's the idea. While others coming from middle class beginnings do the same thing. So if there's a message there because we send a subtle message all the time on TV programs. You always see people wanting to go to the most prestigious of private institutions. Under, you know, you, the writers must come from those places where you see certain names. And that's fine. They're wonderful institutions. But we have so many fine institutions, two and four year, yes. who produce people from public universities, community colleges, who go on to be the best at yes. what they do. And yes. that should be the message of American higher education. Absolutely. And, you know, the examples of, of your former students and of your faculty that you've just shared, in my mind, are the personification of the American dream, right? Yes. That, that is what we think of when we, when yes. we envision what the American dream actually looks like. Yes, yes. But... Have we really fulfilled our commitment to making that dream equally available to everyone? No, you, no, we no, still no. have, you know, if you're from the lowest income families, yeah. you have about the same chance today as you did back in the 60s. Yeah. I don't want to keep going back to the 60s, but, no, but you have right. your odds of getting a, a college education have not changed much since yeah. then. Yes. And there yeah. are examples like UMBC and, you know, others, Georgia State, yeah. that have figured out how to close these gaps. Yeah. But those examples are still far too few. The exceptions. They are the exceptions. Yes. You're, you're so right, Danette. You're so right. The, the fact is, we have a long way to go in this country that structural racism is still very real, mm -hmm. that discrimination against poor people, lack of opportunities. Uh, you know, I often quote Aristotle, who says, choice, not chance, determines destiny. Well, as one of my young faculty said to me in countering, they said, yeah, but what if you don't have the chance to make the choice? Wow. You know, it's powerful. It really stopped. She stopped me up. And it was so true that, yeah, we need to do all we can to choose correctly. But what about the children 
who never get the chance to make a choice. You know, and so I would say that American higher education has just begun to fulfill the dream, but with a long way to go for the majority of Americans, because the majority of families, remember, two thirds of people still don't have anybody who graduated from a four year institution. Mm -hmm. So we have a long way to go and to understand the power of community colleges and what you can do if you get one of those AA degrees, for example. Right. So the idea of education, two and four year, should be more important now than ever as we think about post-secondary opportunities. And the challenge is this, that many people don't understand why we haven't had more graduate. And it has a lot to do with our value system mm. in this country. When we hear people saying all the time, oh, so many people don't value a college education, show me a family that has had one or two people graduate from college who wouldn't want their children to go to college. Right. I don't care what political party. You know, it, 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 it's crazy to say otherwise, number one. OK, number two, from my perspective, I go back to my foundation in Birmingham with my mother, the English and math teacher. Large percentages of America's children cannot read and think well. Mm -hmm. So the notion of connecting our higher education system more uh, deeply and uh, more seriously to the pre-K through 12 system, not just in the language, but in the substance of what we do mm -hmm. as we think about preparing children pre-K, pre-K all the way up. We in universities and colleges have to be more concerned about and interested in what happens with children because it's that foundation that they develop even before starting the first grade. So a college president needs to talk about that. You see, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. we've got a number of programs on our campus focused on pre-K through 12 from the choice program that you might remember for yes. first time offenders, yes. children between eight and 17 and 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 literally supervising them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If, if somebody goes to the Shriver Center at UMBC in the choice program, 30 years, we've served over 10,000 families all the way to the Sherman Scholars Program, preparing teachers to work in challenging schools from early childhood through middle school math. And literally working to build those skills. We all saw in the last few weeks around the country that children from low income backgrounds had scores that were much lower than they'd ever been before because of this online period of challenges that it was only advantaged children who had somebody there at the house to help them stay on, on task. So what is my point? Oh, no, we are just beginning to fulfill the dreams for those of us privileged enough, the one third to get an education, yeah, we're better off than we ever thought we would be. But for the majority of Americans, uh, we have that challenge and responsibility to mm -hmm. help those children and those families to get to the next level. Mm -hmm. By all means, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. So as you look back over your 30 years and, and you think about um, you, uh, stepping down from this post at UMBC, Given the challenge that is still ahead of us, yes. what, what do you tell the rest of us to do? Ah. We still have a couple of decades left. <laughs> Number one, to keep hope alive. At the end of every one of my speeches and my meetings with my colleagues on campus, with, with others in the University System of Maryland, they know to hear me say at the end, keep hope alive. Hmm. Because in the darkest hours, we must have those candles. We must light that candle and keep hope alive because we can do this. Leaders believe, I don't care how bad it gets, we can do this. We have to believe in ourselves. Number two, we must be able to speak truth to power. We must be able to say when something is going well or when we see people are not doing well. We had a, uh, I wrote an article with the Secretary of Juvenile Services uh, in the state of Maryland talking about the fact that if you have a child of color and you have a white child, boys who commit the same crime, that black child or Hispanic child is much more likely to get a record than the white child for a number of reasons whether you have a lawyer or you're in a community where they think of a child as a child or you're in a place where you treat a 13 year old like he's a man you know and and the, the, the data that the secretary of juvenile services showed that this was the case we mm -hmm. must teach people to use the evidence mm -hmm. and all of us have to speak about that but the one thing i would say for people who are and I, I continue. I, I have every intention of working with universities around the country for years to come. I'm just getting started. I love it. I love the passion, <laughs> right? Yes. But what I would say is that we must be the champions of higher education. 
We must not allow the media, media to say, oh, people are questioning higher education. No, they're not. Not in the sense of those who've been privileged to get some higher education. Now, if you've never had a chance to go to college, then you don't know what it's about. You really don't know. And you need support in understanding how it can help your children. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't know families who've had one child do well who didn't say, I want the next to do well. And that's, that's the message. We have to be the voice saying, I'm an, I'm, a, I'm an example. Each of us is an example of what happens when we get an education and we want others to do the same. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Sure. So, you know, UMBC is a kind of place where you can get an exceptional education no matter your major, humanities, uh, arts, uh, fine arts, uh, you, you've gotten yeah. so much acclaim yeah. for yeah. Um, your work in STEM that sometimes um, we have to make sure to say, regardless of your interests, yes. you can get an exceptional education with a wonderful experience. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I wanted to make sure to say that. I but appreciate I that. We <laughs> need to, to emphasize for, because we're looking for more students. We get so many students in STEM. 55, 60%. We are always excited about the students in the humanities, social sciences, and the arts because we need those in our society. We need to make sure everyone is broadly educated, but we need the artists. Mm -hmm. We need the ethicists. You see, we, we need doctors who are hum humanely trained and who are educated in the humanities. Uh, and with these public health issues, there are so many ethical questions we have to ask. So we need the experts. Uh, in the disciplines, and we need people broadly educated. And we want to, to make that point very emphatically, emphatically important on our campus, very important. Absolutely. Um, but I do want to talk, um, Dr. Abowski, about um, the program that you co-founded prior to your becoming presidency. Okay. okay. Um, the, the Meyerhoff Scholarship Program. Yes. So back in 1988, yes. uh, before you were named president, you worked with the philanthropist and founded this program that was designed to increase the number yes. initially of black males earning PhDs or MD PhDs in, yep. science, in the sciences and, and yes. engineering, the STEM fields. Yes. And then it was opened up to, to African-American women and now yes. to all students who care about increasing yes. the diversification of those fields and serving yes the communities that have traditionally not been well served. Yep. The, the, the success of the program has been uh, astounding and that is without hyperbole. Yeah, thank you. What gave you the audacity to think? In 1988, <laughs> yeah. UMBC was still a very young institution yeah, 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 without yeah. the acclaim that it has now. Yeah. You were, you were you know, a, a, a seasoned administrator, but right. you hadn't had the tenure Right. And so what gave you the, the, the sure. gall to think that you could establish a program, given, yeah. given the data, given the context, given right. everything that would say this is impossible? Yeah. What made you think we can substantially increase the number of Black men, Black yes. women, and yes. others committed yes. to this work? Yes. Increase the number, not just, just have, you know, bachelor's degrees. Right. We're talking right. about PhD, yeah. MDs. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate that. Um, you've done your homework. You do know the story. It's very interesting <laughs> from having been on this campus at a certain period, but yes. having read and thought about it. But let me say several things. Number one, it's funny. I was in my 30s at the time. Uh, I love youth. I love youth because when we are young, and I call young anybody under 55, all right, with the, <laughs> but at this point in my life. Yeah. But when we, the younger we are, the more we are willing to experiment. And to say, well, why not? Let's try it. The older we get, if we're not careful, we won't be saying, been there, done that, it won't work. So mm -hmm. I'm always about encouraging and empowering young people. But I was very privileged at that point to, to ask the hard question, what could we do? Because I, I couldn't find, we had really looked around the country, we couldn't find one institution that had sent even 10 to 15 Blacks on a year who completed PhDs in STEM, not one in the country. And the only ones who had a few people going on more than anybody else would have been HBCUs. Mm -hmm. uh, my beloved Hampton and Howard and Xavier and Morehouse and Spelman and one or two other A&T and Morgan. Those were institutions that were producing some, but particularly for predominantly white institutions, there was no place. And but for institutions in general, so it wasn't to be fair to the, the to, to the real history. It wasn't that I felt, oh, we can do this. I simply had the question. Mm. Can we do this? What would it take to have larger numbers, not just surviving in these areas, 
but thriving and soaring and wanting to go on and get a PhD. Because if you're barely making it in chemistry, you're not going to want to go and try to get a PhD in chemistry and you're not going to be admitted anyway. You know, so it was about literally using the Du Bois philosophy of let's find the highest achieving students we can and see if we can help them go on to get PhD. People make the mistake of thinking, oh, if you go to the, the best students, of course they're gonna make it. No, they don't. No, they don't. Let me just give you one statistic. I was privileged to chair both the Obama Commission on African-American Excellence in Education mm -hmm. for a number of years. And I also chaired the National Academy of Sciences uh, Commission on Underrepresentation in Science. So we got all the data in 2011 when we report when we uh, submitted our report 2.2 percent of the phds in the natural sciences and engineering were awarded to african americans 2.2 percent and a slightly smaller i mean larger percentage for hispanic but not substantially smaller uh, larger but here's the point 10 years later we just published an article in issues in science and technology the number has gone from 2.2 percent to 2.3 percent in 10 years we haven't even gone up a full one percent if you look at all the national agencies in america i can tell you from looking at all the data not even two percent of the scientists the phd scientists are black from nih to nsf to nih to ns to nist all the the numbers all the acronyms nist and and nsa not two percent are black and slightly larger percentage for Hispanics. So even when you look at the best prepared minority students, the majority are not succeeding and being inspired to go on for PhDs. Mm -hmm. uh, and why, why the PhD? We need some to be on the professoriate. I wrote an article with colleagues on how higher education can address racism. And I say, we say that we are very good about critiquing society, we in universities, but we rarely go inward as the book says, to look in the mirror and say, what about us? Mm -hmm. we, we should give ourselves very low marks for our inability so far to diversify the professoriate. Mm -hmm. The percentages are very small of people of color on the professoriate. And, um, and when we say we can't find them or they don't exist, that's not, that's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. They are there. There are more and more, we're seeing more and more people coming through who need support and who can move on the faculty. Our STRIDE, S-T-R-I-D-E program at UMBC has been successful in attracting more Blacks and Hispanics to the faculty mm -hmm. uh, at both in the arts, humanities and social sciences uh, most successfully. And that still means we're only maybe 10 to 12%, but we've made progress and then getting a presence in science and engineering. Mm -hmm. But it, you're hard pressed to find more than one or two blacks or Hispanics in departments, in research campuses and wonderful liberal arts colleges um, of blacks and Latinos today, mm -hmm. while mm -hmm. the percentage of students continues to go up and they want to see people looking like themselves and students in general need to see humankind represented in the professoriate. That is the issue that we face. Can you say more about that last point, you know, that that, uh, you know, Latino students, black students, Native American yeah. students need to see themselves represented, Absolutely. but all students need all to see, students need to those see that. individuals as well. Yep. yep. And I want, you know, we want we want faculty who can say I'm first generation college, too. Yes. And I can and you can become a professor being the first in your family to go to college. You know, when I mentioned, for example, Dr. Clements. My, my mentee, Jim Clements at Clemson, first in his family to go to college. When I mentioned Jack Thomas, who's at Central State University, a mentee who grew up in rural Alabama. I'm from the big city, Birmingham. I tease him. I'm the city boy. He's the country boy. He's from where my dad is from, below Selma. Mm -hmm. And um, he was first in his family, not only to go to college, but to finish high school, to finish high school. Has a PhD in English was president of a university in the Midwest, now president of Central State. People need to know these examples. Mm -hmm. They need to know that you can be first in your family to go to college and go on and be a college president or a doctor or whatever you want to do. The, the last Surgeon General, Jerome Adams, another Mahoff, had, mm -hmm. gr had grown up in Southern Maryland. He had never seen a Black physician, Danette, ever. Mm -hmm. 
Wow. And he goes on to get a medical degree from Indiana, grad degree from Berkeley, becomes a professor in Indiana, and then becomes um, the Surgeon General. Think about it, having never seen a physician who was looking like him. So mm -hmm. these things are possible. These are examples to inspire. But in the same breath, I have to say, but most little kids have not been taught to, to be inspired. Hmm. to want to be good in school, to want to learn reading and math and chemistry. So yeah, I go back to your point. I give these examples to keep hope alive, but in the same breath, I'm saying, oh no, we have so much more work to do. Hmm. You know, And the one thing I would say that I feel very good about in the graduates of UMBC, uh, including the first black and first woman speaker of the Maryland House of Delegates, Adrian hmm. Jones, a psychology major, right? Is hmm. that my graduates of all races believe in paying it forward. They are, it's not that they're doing it just for themselves. This is a part of the role of American higher education. You're not getting a job, uh, uh, an education just to get a good job to take care of your family. Of course, that's a given, but what are you doing for other people? Mm -hmm. So when I think about this delegate who has led all of this social reform in, in this state, yes. quite frankly, in the last two years, involving these kinds of issues, I think, what should higher education be doing? It should be preparing leaders to serve the public, mm. preparing leaders to serve the public of all groups and being willing to speak power, speak truth to power, and sometimes to be the power and to hear the truth. Mm -hmm. That's the other part of it that's especially significant, very important. Yes, yes. And, and you you write and, and speak a lot about the role of higher education in fulfilling the promise of democracy. Yes. Like the, the, oh, yeah. the civic role yes. that higher education yes. plays. So it's, yes. it is, of course, the technical skill, but it is something far greater than that. Oh, it's so important. You know, Justice Brandeis um, once said that the most important role in American society is that of citizen. As we work to help more people coming from other countries to become citizens, as we look at those of us who are fortunate to be here, who have a role to play and to teach children and others and families that you have this opportunity to help shape your destiny by the people you select as your leaders, because they are the ones who will make the laws that would either hurt us or help us. And that's, it's so important. You know, uh, my friend, Fred Lawrence, the secretary of Phi Beta Kappa, says that the, the, the fundamental role of, of higher education is to prepare our students to be able to, to develop their own positions on important topics and to be able to present their point of view and back it up with evidence, number one. Number two, to be willing to hear arguments and positions different from their own and to analyze the evidence that they present. And number three, to work to find that common ground. You know, we all say that, but it's really hard sometimes to find that common ground. Our Center for Democracy, led by our colleague David Hoffman, is amazing in working with people from every political party, from every relation, uh, religious and racial group, and, and bringing in speakers who will sometimes be controversial mm -hmm. to push us to think, you see, and to have points of view presented that it will give us a chance to see the different sides of the argument. Yeah. I like to use the language, we should teach ourselves, students, but ourselves, to learn how to agree, to disagree agreeably, or to agree mm -hmm. to disagree with civility. Because here's the problem. If we hear somebody else's point of view and it is outrageous and it's offensive, if we become angry, this is the, this is the challenge. Those, and I didn't make this up, it's, I can't find who said it, but it, it's a wonderful quote I've heard all my life. Those the gods wish to destroy, they first make angry. Those the gods, and for leaders in higher education, it's really important. Because if I make you angry, I can make you say things you will regret. You know, better to say, let me think about it. Or just to be silent until you really think through not only what you think about it, but what's the most effective approach in addressing mm -hmm. whatever it is that may be offensive or something that you really don't agree with. Mm -hmm. And so that is our challenge in higher education because we, we get to a certain point and we like this before we even get That's started. Right. Right. You know, and so that is a challenge we face. Well, and I've heard you say that many times before that, that 
Yeah. If you can make someone angry. You basically, you, you know, you own them at that yeah, point that's exactly right. because that's they are, exactly right. they're reacting in ways yeah. that aren't thoughtful and rational. Yes. But to that, that, that point you made earlier about being able to find common ground. Yes. Yes. How do you think about that today when yeah. so many issues are, are politicized and, yeah. and, and partisan, you know, right out the yeah. gate before yeah. it, before you can even uh, be thoughtful about them, yeah. they are kind of laced with this yeah. um, uh, something that makes it divisive. Yeah, from even, the beginning, even things that that should not be. Yeah, right? no, I so, agree. So, with you. what advice do you have? Sure. Um, given that in this day and age, um, that's kind of how so many conversations begin. You know, I, we believe in focus groups of different types on this campus. Mm. I enjoy leading focus groups with student leaders, with other leaders, and with the random group of students, sometimes randomly selected, sometimes with special groups with returning students, with our veterans, for example, with the uh, women's center students, you know, just a variety of groups uh, with, with different organizations on the campus, and then bringing in different, the cultural groups coming together. And the first challenge we face is to build some trust among people, to, to develop a space where people can feel, I can say what I really think, and I'm not gonna be knocked down immediately when I say it. And that's hard, it's very hard. Mm -hmm. Or, or to, to, to help people understand, they can tell us what the truth is from their perspective. And it may not be what I wanna hear, but we have a term here, retriever courage. Mm -hmm. um, again, we are the Chesapeake Bay Retrievers, but, and we, we started using that during the Title IX challenges that we faced, because while we thought we were doing all the right things, we had a lot to learn. I apologize to students because we hadn't done as much as I thought we had. And we made a lot of progress with everybody presenting with um, amazing listening sessions that were painful, mm -hmm. where students said, Doc, we just want you to hear it. We don't want you to have to respond, but you need to hear what we're feeling, right? But in going through those painful conversations, we were building trust, you know? And it's when you build the trust that you can then work together on recommendations and approaches that people can say, well, I had a chance to participate in whatever we decide to do, you see. But it does take a combination of building trust, which only comes when people believe there is authenticity. Mm. People must believe our colleagues, staff and faculty, our students must believe we care about them, that people do matter. Mm -hmm. And that this is not about a game. This is not about an agenda. We want to figure out how we can be most effective, right? And most supportive, especially during this time, Dan, that for mental health issues for everybody, right? More caring, more willing to hear what we don't want to hear, the courage to hear the unthinkable. Mm -hmm. you see mm -hmm. and to give yourself time to think okay what does this mean for this campus and it doesn't happen overnight it takes time and sessions and developing the skill to facilitate the tough conversations yeah so, so i i so appreciate that and and one of the things i took away from the um, empowered university. And I don't know if this is right, but this is how I made sense of it. Mm -hmm. I thought that you were suggesting that there is a role for the actual learning to play in facilitating that trust building. So when yeah. you, I think you called it community engaged learning yeah. when students yeah. uh, are, are, who come from different perspective, backgrounds, yep. points of view yeah. are engaged in the work, you know, in yeah. the work that provides them with an opportunity to get to know each other and do that oh, trust building. So the learning yeah. itself is a mechanism for that. That's exactly right. That's you are you are on point. And there are many settings on this campus and others where we are working to have these the activity sometimes involving working with communities, mm -hmm. but reflecting on that work, sometimes involving disagreements or times when people are upset with the university mm -hmm. or when things have been said that are offensive. We had a a session led by my our Muslim Student Association recently, and to have more people, we did it outside, mm -hmm. and it was powerful. It was very powerful to hear those perspectives. Uh, I had the privilege of my wife and I, girlfriend, and I years ago as Hampton students spent a half year in Egypt and studied Islam and Arab society, 
And so I brought with me that sense from that community in Cairo from 50 years ago, almost, yeah, 50 years ago. And what I will tell you is, but to hear my students and to look into their faces of students who practice Islam, who are Muslims, and to see the diversity in that community, first of all, people have certain assumptions, right? But to hear how they are processing how they are being treated or what's happening and what we're working to do to be supportive on the one hand, uh, to work with our students from Hillel on another hand, in wonderful ways to see what they've gone through with anti-Semitism, to work with other groups, black students, Latino groups, and you see how there are points of commonality and then unique points that we need to appreciate. But being able to listen, yeah. to listen, it seems to me, is just so, and reflect. And for, for those of us who are over a certain age, to open our minds to the fact that people who are younger will think about things very differently sometimes. And we cannot dismiss the way they think about those things. Even as we talk about social media, I keep learning from my students because I have certain points of view about social media, certain parts of social media. And it, it, but it helps me to hear why people do what they do mm -hmm. and to see how we, again, can find that common ground. Absolutely. You know, and there's some things I will say, old school, just remember whatever you put out there, it's going to be that when you go for that first interview. <laughs> yes. All right. Now, you sure you want to say, let me tell you what my alums have said before. I wish I hadn't done that, all right? You just wanna make sure you're ready for that, right? Mm -hmm. And then, but at the same time, to understand how you can build community in a positive way through social media while trying to minimize that part of it that can be toxic. You mm -hmm. get my point? And, and so it's my trying to hear their language and use their language to help me. Mm -hmm. You know, years ago when I began to understand why it was important for me to use my pronouns sometimes, you know, and to, mm -hmm. to appreciate that in respect, out of respect. I mean, all of that. So I think the learning is not just for the students, then that the mm. learning should be for us. Mm. What are the things we learn? I learn from my little choice kids who are first time offenders when I'm talking to a 13 year old kid and I'm hearing his perspective and seeing how he sees the world differently. You see, um, I mean, it's important. Or when I'm talking to returning women and they're telling me how they're viewed in some areas in a wonderful way on this campus and in other ways, how we have a room, room to grow. Or when I hear veterans saying somebody in a classroom looks at them when they're talking about war and killing, when they don't want to be seen as the expert, you know, you hear that and you think, I hadn't thought about that, right? Mm -hmm. So as, as we say, the, the courage, the retrieval courage to hear other perspectives and give serious consideration mm -hmm. to weigh how people see things compared to how I see them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and you said, you know, you learn, you, you learn so much from your students. Ooh. Uh, yeah. but that requires a level of vulnerability too I appreciate that. and 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 and, and, that. and many leaders may not be willing to expose themselves in that way how would yeah. you respond to that you know i the older i get the more humble i become mm -hmm. i, I, I want to give you a southern uh lesson from my grandmother who uh was only allowed to go to the sixth grade and yet who read everything it was a brilliant woman um uh, I was having problems with some of the kids in my class because I was so excited about math and I would always get kicked because they would say, stop being so excited about math. And the teacher would give us 10 problems and I'd say, give us 10 more and the whole class would go, shut up, Freeman. <laughs> <laughs> but I tell you that because, and then sometimes some of those same kids who had not been nice to me would want to be my friend. Sometimes to get tutors or whatever. And I would say, grandma, should I trust them? Mm. And And- and she said, she gave me two lessons. The first was, she said, you get to know the character of the person. She said, you, you can put a, a silk blanket on a, a zebra. Just don't forget the stripes are still there. I'll never forget that lesson, that you mm -hmm. want to get to the soul of this, the character of the person mm -hmm. and build out the best in them. That's number one. But the other lesson is about humility. She said, I always want you to stay on your knees, son. And I said, why, Grandma? And she said, well, for the obvious reason, you want to always be praying. She said, but but for this reason, you're going to do well in life. You study hard. You like people. She said, but the higher up you go, just remember this. When you fall and you will fall, the mm -hmm. higher up you go, the harder it's going to be on you. When you get knocked down, the higher up you go, just know you're going to get knocked down. Mm -hmm. But if you stay on your knees and your attitude, you won't fall too far. And that was wisdom from a sixth grade educated woman. 
former, the daughter of slaves. Mm. I'll never forget that lesson about humility, that we, as we go into these high powered positions, we sometimes start thinking we are the position. No, I am not. I, I am Raymond Rabowski. I sit in the presidency and I'm honored to sit in that chair, but I'm about to leave it, but I'm whole. When I leave, mm. I am Freeman Rabowski. We must remember there's a distinction between the position yes. and who we are, you know, and, and that centering and understanding the importance of humility is at the heart of the beginning of wisdom. I love that. Thank yeah. you. Uh -huh. Thank you. We are getting questions coming in uh, furiously, and we will probably only have time for one or two. Sure. But I think this is a good one. Um, they ask, given Dr. Rabowski's upcoming retirement, yes. how are you preparing UMBC to continue the great work achieved under your leadership? Yes. You know, uh, years ago when there was a group of presidents here to evaluate me, one of them said, it was amazing, he said, well, what are you going to do when Freeman leaves? And one of the heads of the faculty said something that I was, I heard about it later on. Uh, she said, uh, we love Freeman, uh, but we will be fine because we believe the same things. That what we're talking about, this inclusive excellence is in the DNA of UMBC. We hire with that in mind, faculty and staff, you know, and it was the best thing. I could ever hear people are thinking, oh, they won't be okay. They're going to be fine. There's so many people here empowered to lead of every race, men and women, people from all kinds of backgrounds. We talk about diversity in every religion and race and LGBTQ and income level. And we talk about those things with, with great respect. Mm -hmm. And it's not a few people. It's not in one department. Across this campus, I mean, I, it has been my honor to be here. It's I, people say, why did you stay so long? Because people are wonderful to me. So the presidency is strong. That's different from me. It is the idea that people want to work with a leader as a thought partner. Yes. Not to come in telling them what to do. Oh, no, 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 no. As a thought partner, the best thing an impressive leader can do to be effective is to ask the questions mm -hmm. and to be ready to learn and to take the time to understand the culture of the institution. To come in trying to talk about what you did somewhere else is not gonna work here. No, you have to understand this culture. And that's what that person will do. I've, I've continued to say, and she will be a fabulous president. Did you get that? And she will be a fabulous president. I'm purposely putting it into the air. It'd be wonderful if it were a woman. It really would. <laughs> 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 that that's amazing. Um, so we we just got a great question in, Dr. Baski. Uh -huh. Um, someone asked, you know, we're just hearing the sad news today of Bell Hooks passing. Yeah. Oh. And, oh. and the person asked, I'd be interested in hearing you reflect on how yes. her writing and thoughts yes. might contribute to this conversation yes. about leadership for inclusive excellence. Yes. You know, I I've been texting with. I have a a group of. Um, I have different groups of mentees, but I've got a, a, a small group of very powerful black women intellectuals. And uh, we were talking about Bella. And, and I, I have people in Kentucky um, who are wonderful. Uh, Ann Grundy and her family are there at Kentucky State, but she's a graduate of Berea, uh, Ann Grundy is. And Ann is the, is the daughter of former president, I mean, of the minister of the church that was bombed in Birmingham. Mm. Very civil rights. <laughs> oriented and we were talking about balance and what we said was here's an example of an intellectual who was a giant she was a giant and dying at a young age late 60s or something but who has given us such brilliant writing and who has shown us what excellence means and i would even call it inclusive excellence because her messages can be strong for black women, but for all of us in talking about humankind. Mm -hmm. And whenever you can say, you know, a giant, you're talking about someone whose legacy and whose work will go on well beyond the time of people who've seen her in person mm -hmm. to generations to come. We will be talking about her. It, she was a great woman. And mm -hmm. it is with such honor and humility that I would put her in the category with my number one hero, who is uh, Mary McLeod Bethune, as an example, with Sister Meyer, obviously with Toni Morrison, mm -hmm. and with my mama's favorite, Zora Neale Hurston. 
You know, it's it's those wonderful women of letters uh, and of education who continue to inspire us. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So I, I want to give you um, um, our last five minutes to reflect on a final question. Yes. But first, I just want to comment. Uh, you have introduced into this conversation about uh, the names of about 20 of your mentees. Have you ever quantified the number of mentees that you have? Uh, because it must be in the tens of thousands. <laughs> so I've got, really <laughs> I, I love that. I've got many. I was texting today. I mean, I am, uh, if there are mentees and thought, thought leaders with me from uh, a, men, a mentor would be Janetta Cole, yeah. but, uh, and then uh, Beverly, former president there, Tatum, dear friend and mentee, I, and just a wonderful person. And then right now, Mary Smith Campbell, I was there with her and David, and so Moelle and Spellman are wonderful. And I'm one of the few men who's an honorary Spellmanite. I'm very proud of that. They gave me an honorary degree. Very nice. But all the way up to Wellesley, first black president of Wellesley, Paula yes. Johnson, just yes. amazing. So we've got all these people who are um, wonderful, wonderful intellectuals mm -hmm. who put their research and their thinking into practice in special ways, you know? And um, from my perspective, uh, when I think about my mentees, I think about people of different generations. Mm -hmm. The students that I mentioned, Chelsea Penix is leading first black to lead MD Anderson's radiation oncology. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable young woman who shows us you can be an MD PhD from Penn, and be married and have three kids and be leading at the leading place in the world for radiation oncology. Think about it. I mean, it's just, you know, the first black woman to get a PhD in computer science from Michigan, Callum McMullen down at Florida right now. So I got all these people who are leading in their pathways, right? Mm -hmm. And I like to think they shoot me just text messages and emails of inspiration every day, every day. And it just makes me more and more passionate about it. And I learn from them all the time and the people on this campus of every race who are um constantly sending me notes um saying um thank you doc what can i do to help you freeman uh, you better be in contact blah 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 and it's the idea of staying in contact with people mm -hmm. true mentoring you know and of all the people i can mention i mentioned before i told you my wife i married miss delta from hampton jackie We've been married over 50 years now. Um, she's more fabulous now than ever, but she has taught me so much about mentoring. Mm. She just she has a Jackie Rabowski Scholars Program, and um, she's got mentees. A number of them are here at UMBC, but she's got mentees at several of the HBCUs. We've got Hampton. We do a lot in Hampton, our beloved Hampton. But but this is what I want you to hear. So she's got mentees who go back to the ninth grade when she started mentoring them then. Mm. all the way through UMBC, now to marriage and to everything else. And they're still her mentee, you know? And I like to think of people we've worked with for years. So the true mentoring comes not when you work with somebody for a year, but over the years and the stages of their lives. Alicia Wilson, mm -hmm. valedictorian from Mervo, from a trade school, comes here, goes to law school, is now vice president for economic development at Hopkins and chair of the board of College Bound, the program she came through. Jackie was on the board with her this morning, uh, just um, as we work to get more kids into college. So the mentoring should be something that we see as a part of our lives, mm -hmm. not as something we're doing for a job. And finally, the distinction between mentoring and championing. To yes. be a champion, an advocate and a champion means you don't just give advice when they want it. You are intrusive. You know, Southern, Southerners are intrusive. We will give you the good and the bad. We would just say, I love you. And I got to tell you the truth, but we will also knock down doors for you. That's Mike Summers here. This wonderful professor in biochemistry knocks down doors mm. from when he talks with people at the agencies and universities. Uh, is she getting an interview? She's the best. Make sure you look at her closely. Do you have any other blacks in the committee uh, in the interview pool? You know, he will. And then he works with them to make sure they get tenure. You, you mm. want to think that way. Not just in undergrad school and grad school and postdoc, but every job. I love working with people as they're working to become presidents and deans mm -hmm. and provosts. And then once they become that, to give them that support, even after getting that job, because success is never final. That must be the lesson. Success is never final. 
I love that. Dr. Bassi, we're at time, but I'd like for you to comment on one final thing. Yes. Because you've talked a lot today about questions. Um, you said, you know, you, you're, one of your main roles is asking the good questions. I love a good question myself. Yeah. Yeah. You said that the, the, the origin of the Meyerhoff was from a question that you yes. asked yourself. So yes. as you think about your 30 years. Yes. And all that has come from your questions. Yes. How do you reflect on the power of a question yes, yes. to spur great change? Yeah. So, so yes. I asked you before we got on, did you ever even imagine yeah. what could be accomplished? Yeah. Yeah. And it all started with a question. Yeah. So can you leave us with some thoughts on that? Yeah, I, it would be, it's this notion that somehow there are questions we have not even thought about. I chair audit committees. Um, at the Sloan Foundation and a couple of wonderful corporate boards. And, and the best question of all when you're auditing whatever is, what is it that keeps us up at night, mm -hmm. number one? And number two, what is it we haven't even thought about? That, that's the, I mean, of all the questions and from my view as a mathematician, as somebody who studies literature, I've been reading the, the Wasteland for 40 years and constantly struggling with the meaning there of T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. Um, what is it that should be in our universal questions and we haven't even pulled it in because we haven't thought about it? Because I guarantee you, as much as we may think about things, there are things we haven't even thought about. Let me just get, my, my, one of my, my mentee, uh, uh, Kafri Zarasa says, the time will come very soon, he's a neuroscientist, we'll be able to talk and have this conversation and not move our mouths. We'll be able to communicate brain to brain. I said, you mean in my lifetime? He said, absolutely. <laughs> We're there now. I mean, just think, most of us haven't thought about the idea of having conversations where we don't hear, we just from brain to brain. It's stuff you see that you think about it from TV, but there will be sensors we can use. Now, just as I hadn't thought about the idea of people having phones in their pockets. You know, when I was in college, the futurists came and said, we're gonna get to the time when people will have phones walking around. And I, and I got up and being the smart kid, thinking I'm a smart and said, oh, that couldn't happen because the lines would get cr crossed up. Because we, in 1968 and 70, you'd never heard of a phone without having a cord to the wall, wireless. You see what I'm saying? People mm -hmm. hadn't thought about it. And so, and then I got the first phone on this campus in 92 to put in your pocket as the president. There was mm -hmm. nobody else on campus in 1992 who had a phone, a portable phone. And it was a huge thing that you could put in your pocket, right? Now, today, you don't find anybody without a phone. But who could have imagined that years before? Similarly, not just in technology. Who could have imagined we'd have to wear masks all the time? You know, right? So, so here's the question. It is how do we get a mindset that suggests things will be changing constantly? And how do we position ourselves to prepare for the storm? Because the storm will continue to come. That, that is the ultimate question that we have. And in that storm, how do we be, how can we be elevated to still be inspired in the midst of the storm? Dr. Rabowski, thank you. It's an honor to have you for my final Equity First webinar. And I thank you for being so generous with your time and with your wisdom. I appreciate it. Dr. Danette Howard, I told you, Dr. Yvette Mosey Ross and others said you, you are a star when you were right out of grad school, they knew you were going places and you're doing just that. So as one of my mentees, you are fabulous and I'm proud of you. Thank you, Doc. <laughs> have a great afternoon. Thank and you. Thank you everyone for joining us. Have a great afternoon and happy holidays.